We're getting ready to go to chapter 9 of Revelation this evening. Uh, and I think almost all evangelical commentators see in this passage demons released from the place of confinement to serve Satan, who's that fallen star we'll see here in verse 1. And these angels, these fallen angels, demons, will torment men on the earth for about five months. And most believe the earthly demons Christ encountered in the Gospels were a few of possibly millions. I mean, we don't know the number of demons, of all fallen angels that fell with Satan from the presence of God at some point in eternity past. So, one of these uh, un unchained fallen angels or demons know they await a future judgment. And when they cried out to Jesus in Matthew 8:29. What have we to do with thee, Jesus, Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They understand that. And Luke 8, 31 says, And they besought him that he would not commit them to go into the deep, the abyss. These fallen angels know their fate. Secondly, there are chained angels right now, demons, who are, according to Jude, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reversed, preserved into everlasting chains under the darkness unto the great a judgment of the great day. Further, he goes on to say in 2 Peter 2, 4, God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved to judgment. So here in Revelation, some of these confined fallen angels are going to be released to torment mankind. These mysterious beings with their origins in the bottomless pit now are summoned forth to spread destruction and desolation upon the earth. Satan himself is a fallen spiritual star, if you will, and John beholds him falling into the earth with evil intentions on man. He wants to take it out on us. He's then I let him loose against me and all the evil powers which he has in his command. But remember at all times God's in control, not the devil. And since these creatures we're going to see here do have hellish power, we might think that these monsters would kill and with their poison and, because it's worse than the earthly scorpions. But now these monsters aren't allowed to kill. Their victims are only to be tormented. So the infliction is actually worse than a rapid death. It's like the burning torment that follows a scorpion sting after he strikes a human. I don't know what that feels like, but I've heard it's very unpleasant. And this torment is going to come from millions, possibly millions, of these inescapable monsters who strike their victims with countless stings. So that little introduction, let's begin a look at chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and a star fall, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now the fifth angel trumpeted, then I saw an asteroid which had plummeted out of heaven unto the earth, and the key of the shaft of the abyss was given to him. Now the abyss here surrounding this fifth trumpet are given and a lot of explanation here of what's going on implying that this is an important step in God's progressive and increasing judgment on the earth here. The fifth trumpet produces an angel that opens the place that permits, we'll say, poisonous locusts, if you will. A creature like with stings like scorpions whose sting hurts people for five years but they can't kill anyone. It, they're out now. Because the he in, in verse 2 that we'll see and the king, in verse 11, the star fell upon the earth, was a person rather than a fragment of the star. That's the same kind of seat when it says, and he. So we know that we're talking about that star that fell from heaven. So we, we find out now, as we go through here, we need an identification of the star. I'm going to go for that Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? 
For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the nations, that made the world as a wilderness, that destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house of his prisoners? And in Luke 8, uh, 10, 18, and he, this is Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I think when we read those two, we know who this, we can identify this particular fallen star. And even modern terminology helps us to do that. What do we call a great athlete or somebody who makes movies? We call them a star. And this star, in this case, in verse 1, represents Satan, who's cast out of heaven, at this point, the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and here he is given the key to the bottomless pit, the abyss. And the bottomless pit, or the abyss, abysso in Greek, <coughs> is the home of demons. And Luke 8, 31, Revelation 9, Romans 10, love, is the words translated deep. But it's the same thing. That, and there's a pit, there's a place. They besought, as we said before, and they besought him that he would not command him to go into the deep, that abyss. Or who shall ascend into the deep? And it, again, we're talking about this abyss here. And Satan will be confined for a thousand years in this bottomless pit during the reign of Christ on the earth, as we'll find out over Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the Bible, spinning a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him in the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should not deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. So we've identified here in verse 1 the most important character, of this section, Satan. At some point we see him being cast out, landing here on the earth. So in verse 2 it says, and he was, here's the antecedent that connects us back to the falling star, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And he, that is the star, opened the shaft of the abyss. Then the smoke suddenly went up out of the shaft like the smoke of a smelter's furnace, an awesome furnace. Thus the sun was darkened and the atmosphere blackened because of the smoke coming out of the abyss. Here that star, old Satan, uses the key. Now the key is given to him. That's important. Remember what I'm The key, he was given a key back in verse 1. He does not have this key. He only has it because it's given to him. And by using this key, it allows him to free those demons in that bottomless pit to come out of there and afflict the world. Again, the Lord is in control, not Satan. If he does not get permission from the Lord, these demons are going to stay right where they are. So this also gives us a pretty good view of who's in control. God is controlling every aspect of this. Satan is powerful, don't misunderstand me, but he's not more powerful than God. And he can't free these fellows any other way than without the key that he's given from the Lord. Now, visually, this event represented this great smoke, the darkening of the sky and of the sunlight. It is going to be a very dark day for those in the tribulation. Revelation 9 actually comes from, we see from another section of Scripture that describes it over in Joel chapter 2 where the prophet describes the demon locust army that invades during the day of the Lord. I'm not going to read the entire portion, but I'm just going to give you what he says. First, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. They shall climb the wall like men of war, 
and they shall march every one in his own ways, and they shall not break their ranks. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The day of the Lord is a great and terrible day. Who is able to abide it? Joel sees the same time period as John sees here. So what we have is Satan having the key to allow the, I don't know if all of them come out or not, we're not told, but an untold number of these demons are allowed to, to come out. Verse 3 says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. As from the smoke came out locusts onto the ground, and it was granted to them power as possessing the power of the scorpions of the ground. So when this dead smoke comes out, that's terrifying enough. And then you see demon-like, these demon-like creatures that seem in some form like a locust. And that's uh, very formidable in themselves because locusts physically will just destroy the food for a, a nation or a people. But here they also have the power to sting like scorpions. But I want you to notice something. Very important here in the middle of verse 3. And unto them was given power. What they have, it's given them from the outside. God allows them this power. God is giving them something here. But they, we're going to find out that these creatures do not prey on natural food. They're let loose. And they're let loose on those who are unmarked by divine possession. Those who do not belong to the Lord. Now the church is gone, but there are people who are sealed now. 144,000, two witnesses in Jerusalem, and people who have come to the Lord. Now, in verse 4 we're told this, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And it was told to them that they should not harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, except the men who are not possessing the seal of God upon their forehead. Once again, what do we see here? God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. This is designed for those who do not believe. Those who are sealed, those who are gods, it's not going to affect them. 144,000 are not going to be affected. So this verse implies that these demonic creatures could have physically affected the natural world. By saying not to eat any green thing, they could have destroyed this. They had that power, but God pulls that away. Don't do it. Isn't it amazing that God commands the demons and they obey? Don't do that and they don't do it. He commands us and we go right on doing the same old thing day in and day out. But they could have, it seems, by this verse, to destroy it. But they were ordered by the Lord himself not to do so. Permission, though, was granted for them to bring pain and torture on those not sealed of the Lord the lost. They are going to be tormented. Strangely, even during this terrible time, the world is following Satan and his lordship, and they're following his... Uh, demonic servants and what's happening here these servants of Satan those who are on his side Satan's attacking his own people the ones he already possesses he's attacking them wow that's amazing isn't it and yet they still refuse to accept and honor the Messiah wow Satan attacks his own followers and they continue to follow him Boy, that's blind obedience, isn't it? And to them was given, to them talking about these demonic creatures, it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And it was not given, it was given to them not that they should be able to kill anyone, but instead 
in the future, man should be tormented five months. And the torture of them is as the torture of a scorpion when he should sting a man. Tormented means torture, harassment, and it is mostly physical, but it also can be spiritual. And you know, scorpions were a natural symbol of vicious, dangerous opponents and whose attack was painful and could even be fatal. Ezekiel says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. Scorpions, we understand something terrifying. Jesus in Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on scorpions, serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This verse has really been beaten to death over the years by wrong interpretation. People take this and you go over people who want snake handling churches. Well, don't invite me to speak there, folks. That's not happening. I know better than that, and I'm not going to step on any scorpions unless I have a good pair of boots on. That's not applying to us today in that particular way. So the scorpion in the mindset of the time was fearful. And to be able to be stung that way that you would feel it for five months. Now, have to remember, this doesn't mean you only be stung one time. There are millions of these creatures out there. How many times can you be stung? It can be terrible. Terrible pain to the point that we're reading verse 6. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And in those days men will be seeking the death, and they will in no way find it. And they will be craving to die, but the death is fleeing away from them. If you noticed in, in the Greek, the definite article adjective the. <coughs> That's trans it's very important. That makes death something larger than just dying. Death is more than simply a state. We know that. It's also a principle, a finality, a completion, an absolute condition of total separation from God with no opportunity of being able to turn back, of repenting and coming to Him for, mer for mercy and salvation. Death is the end of that. You go through death without Jesus Christ, you face the death, that second death. And these men in those days, with the Greek, they didn't care. The pain was so bad, they wanted to die, and they did not care about their spiritual being. Just take this pain away from me. And when these lost ones that died, there's no way back to God, and they'd be gone for all eternity. But look at the mercy of God. Out of the smoke, here comes these locusts that are like scorpions. While they're out, they're not harming the vegetation, but they're out there to torture, torment those without the seal of God in their forehead. In chapter 7, the 144,000 were seals, and seal of protection from the plague was extended to all those who know the Lord in that day. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 said, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory. God is still protecting his own. These tribulation saints. And again, you know, these people are out there and we know that the plague is there and that they're tormenting these people for five months with these stings. And these were fearsome, fearsome creatures. I think about the fact they've been confined in that bottomless pit for a long, long time. What are they doing while they're there? Becoming more and more angry. Thinking about what they can do. It's like Satan when he's going to be bound for a thousand years. He is going to become so angry. He's going to be thinking about what he can do when he's released. Now, that is, these are angry, fallen angels. And even though these people are being tormented by the stings of 
these creatures, they're not repenting, they're not turning to God. So they're, it's terrible. But you know, God is merciful on what he's doing here in not allowing these creatures to take the lives of the unbelievers. What's he doing here? He is giving them an opportunity to see that there is salvation. He is giving them that five months to turn to him. They should know now that God is in control. They should realize that these demons are the ones tormenting them. They want to die, and God says, no, you're not going to die. God controls life, and he controls death. He has in his hands. He says, no, you can't take your own life. You think about me. That's exactly what he's telling them. He is being merciful. He is giving them the opportunity, one opportunity here. You know, most of the time, when you're on your back and you're in pain, you turn to him, even unbelievers. Just like people talking about atheists in foxholes, there are no atheists in foxholes. I'll tell you that right now. When those shells start hitting close to you, your brain. And these people should have been turning that way. But maybe they hoped that with Satan they could somehow gain the victory over this torment. They have turned, they're sold out to Satan. He is their God and they're trusting him. But these demons are using that long, pent-up frustration, anger, and rage to torment men as long as God will allow them to do it. And man just seeks death rather than seeks God. Verse 7 says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as faces of men. Now the likeness of the locusts were like horses, having been trained for combat. And upon the hands and heads of them, as it were, crowns of gold. And the faces of them were just like the faces of men. John's having a little bit of a problem describing these fellows for us, isn't he? The description of the locusts compared to horses prepared for battle is a pretty major scene here. Prepared unto battle literally, literally means trained or equipped for battle. Horses who were trained, and you know, we don't have that today, but even up into World War II they did, and those horses had to be trained not to spook at sounds or the turmoils of battle or blood or anything of combat, but to stay focused and go forward. And John said they had crowns like gold. Now, Crowns always in Scripture portray some type of authority and gold uh, royalty. But there's a comparative word here that's important, like. And it could be telling us that these crowns appeared to be gold, but they weren't. The authority of these demons is false. It's limited. It's temporary. You see here again, the devil is a deceiver. He wants people to think he's in control. That he is royalty, but he's not. And with the faces of men, it means there's intelligence. They aren't, you know, angels, even fallen angels, are intelligent beings. And to the ancient, the ancients, intelligence and will are shown in the face. So this is really a wonderful picture that he gives us here, these creatures. They're prepared for battle. They're trying to deceive because of the gold, fake gold, and they have intelligence. They know what to do. They know how to inflict the worst pain that they can. And it goes on to say, and they had hair as, a, as the hair of a woman, and the teeth were as the teeth of lions. And as well, they possessed hair just like the hair of a woman, and the teeth of them were just like those of lions. With these demons appearing horse-like and moving quickly in combat, their hair was you know, probably flying behind them and as a woman who's running with long hair. Of course, today, that could be men, couldn't it? You know, some men have hair pretty long. and I watch the ball game sometimes, and I wonder how these fellas can play ball with the hair hanging halfway down their back. I've seen football, college football games where Actually, someone's been tackled by the grab the hair hanging out of their helmet. 
And I wonder how they, in baseball, how they can do that in the heat, but we see it flowing as they attack. And the reference to hair suggests women who appear violent, aggressive, these fictional theories of Greek mythology. Again, we, we see, you have to kind of look back at some of the mythology that's being taught in, in those days, and even today. And the teeth of lions. Lions' teeth, of course, we know what they're like. We've seen all the shows on them, and they have teeth, and they'll sink it into the back of an animal like a zebra or something, and it finally will bring that animal down. The teeth of, of a lion symbolizes ruthless, unrelenting power, and the lion is indeed the king of the grassland. Again, we're seeing the strength and the force of this demonic army out there. And they had breastplates, as it were, the breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was the sound of many ch of chariots, of many horses running into battle. And also they possessed breastplates, like the iron breastplates. And the sound of the wings of them was just like the sound of chariots, of many horses charging into battle. Breastplates of iron makes me think of the armature of war horses who had iron plates over their chest area. That was protecting them from lances and arrows and that sort of thing in those days. The locusts here are, are declared to have breastplates of iron. And this implies that they too are immune to destruction. There's no way that we, these people on earth at the time, can defend themselves from it. If the picture is, I don't care what you do, where you go, where you hide, go back to Joel. They're on the walls, they're in the house, everywhere. You can't defeat them, you can't harm them. They're equipped with wings, which give forth the sound of many chariots going into battle, which means they have implies speed and the impossibility of invading attack. Also, the sound causes fear. That sound of impending attack. Something you can't defend. And they had tails like a scorpion. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they're possessing tails like scorpions. Even with stings. And the tails of them were the power of them to wickedly oppress the men for five months. Their power to hurt is literally, literally wickedly oppress. That really says it, doesn't it? Not just to hurt, but to wickedly oppress. It means it's to be unjust, to injure, to bring suffering, to damage, to act as wickedly as possible. Now it seems like a terrible way for God to bring men to repentance. But we should remember though the seriousness of eternal separation from God. Think about the dip. Which is better? Someone to go through this and come to Christ for salvation or to go to hell? It's merciful. The Lord Jesus Christ and said, and fear not them which can kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear them which also are able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. God in His mercy said, okay, it's going to be bad, but just turn to me. It will be an act of mercy on God's part to, demit, to permit men to be tormented five months in an effort to bring them to salvation so that they might avoid the eternal torment of hell. Again, what, what is five months of torment compared to eternity? It's merciful. Verse 11 says, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue he had the name Apollyon. They're having over them a ruler, the angel of the abyss, which a name to him, Hebrew, Abaddon, and the Greek name, Apollyon. King means ruler, and the angel, this is the one who opened the pit, that falling stone. Most believe that the name mentioned here that is Satan. Abaddon and Apollyon means destruction and destroyer. You put the two names together and it equals perdition. So Apollyon is properly 
masculine, and it's the opposite of satara, salvation, in the Greek. There are a few commentators who don't think that these names refer to Satan because they say, well, Satan is loose and active today. He can't, he can't be confined. He's not confined to the abyss. They miss the point. They're not reading the entire section. Remember, you have to observe, you have to use context. Satan does not have to be staying in the abyss to be in charge of it. For example, if we're at war and the army is on the other side of the world fighting, okay? And the president is in the White House. He is still in charge of that army even though he's not there. The same thing with Satan. And the passage doesn't say that Satan is confined in the bottomless pit. It says he opens it and he does it with the key that's given him. And we find that these names are the character of Satan and his fallen angels. Now in the modern world, Satan often appears as an angel of light in the role which he says, oh, he's good and religious. Here, we, you see the mask is stripped away. And the evil one is seen in his true character. Satan and his demons are seen as destroyers of the souls of men, and they can only bring affliction, pain, torment. When the divine resists, restraint is resisted, released, I'm sorry, as in this instance here in chapter 9, the true character of the evil one, the true character of Satan, is manifest immediately. You notice God didn't have to tell him twice to release those angels. He didn't have to tell him twice to let them torment men, even if they are his own men. He didn't have to tell them twice. The description of the locusts comparing the horses for battle is awesome. Human faces, crowns of gold, women's hair, and the lion's teeth, iron breastplates, and the wings that sound like horse strong chariots rushing into battle. John obviously describing what he saw, but did not interpret each characteristic for us. The picture is one of Satan's really powerful, supernatural power, and the demon world, especially in relation to the unbelievers. Unlike the previous judgments, the judgments we've seen apparently were just a short time in duration, this one is extended over five months. If you are on the receiving end of this, that's five long months. You know, time, even though it's the same for everyone, it's different depending on what you're going through. If you're on a really enjoyable vacation for five months, it goes by fast. If you're being tormented, as we read here in this passage, that five months could seem like forever. It's going to be a long five months for those folks. So it, it's important as it is that uh, this is important as it is. It refutes the clarity of the notion that all these judgments will occur in just a short period of time, right before the second coming of the Lord. Which some people want to say, but it's all right at the end. And we saw the demons do have a ruler, and Satan have a God, Apollyon. As I said, both words basically destroy you. Now, Satan sometimes it says he's an angel of light. He will try to fool people. I think it's interesting that we're talking about him now because his night is coming up, so be praying for the safety of folks. So this judgment that we see here confirms what we've already was suggested in the preceding judgments that the great tribulation, as Christ described it, would be a time of a great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be over in Matthew 24 21 and we'll pick up Lord willing with the sixth trumpet on next Sunday evening I knew that was as far as we did tonight as well